This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. Stand by, 15 seconds to air. Stand by, all cameras and video tape. Ready with your opening graphics. Stand by, Howard. Here we come, Frank. Ready, Don. Stand by, audio. Your opening music and roll tape. Take tape. tape. Never imagined the Washington Redskins would reach Super Bowl 17. It's going to be a capacity crowd, very close to 103, 104,000. The Redskins that took the field against the Miami Dolphins in January of 1983 were largely a team nobody wanted. They were 53 misfits, outcasts, and rejects. But together, they won. Let's go out to the field today and look at each other and say, we've done all we can. If we win, we win. If we lose, we go win. No one typified this team of wanderers more than quarterback Joe Thiesman. While he always wore number seven, Thiesman wanted to be number one so badly that he changed his name at Notre Dame. Roger Valdeseri, our public relations director, called me in his office. He asked me how I pronounced my last name. I told him it was Thiesman. He told me it was Thiesman. I told him it was Thiesman. He told me it was Thiesman. He said, Joe, there's a trophy out there called the Heisman Trophy. We think you have a shot at it. We're going to change your name from Thiesman to Thiesman to rhyme with Heisman. I said, fine. Contrary to popular myth, the newly christened Thiesman never did win the Heisman Trophy. In 1971, he was drafted by Don Shula's Dolphins, but bolted for the riches of the Canadian Football League. We're getting ready to play in Calgary. A reporter from Miami calls me. Bob Greasy had just gotten hurt. Earl Morrow was going to be the quarterback. They had to go get Earl Morrill because I didn't go. How do you feel now? Bob Greasy's hurt. You would have had an opportunity to be the quarterback of the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins have won Super Bowl seven, have completed the greatest season in NFL history. Through the three years I went to Canada, the Miami Dolphins went on to Super Bowls. And I thought, jeez, man, you blew it. You know, you, you blew it. In 1974, Theismann joined the Redskins, but rarely saw the light of day. The quarterback grew so frustrated, he volunteered to return punts. Holy moly! He is a little devil, isn't he? In 1978, he became the starter, but after three seasons and no playoff berths, Theismann desperately hoped a new coach could rescue his aimless career. I would like to give uh, the Redskins fans uh, the type of team that I think that they would be proud of. 
In Joe Gibbs' mind, that team did not include Theismann, unpredictable running back John Riggins, or straight-ahead dinosaur Mark Mosley. The new coach wanted to replace Washington's old guard. I mean, everybody had somebody else's job. Tom Flick was drafted to take Joe Theismann's job. Joe Washington had John Riggins' job. The guys they went and got were the offensive linemen. And even those were stories. You know, Joe Jacoby came in, they thought he was a defensive lineman. They didn't want to play him at offensive line. I guess we were just the greatest collection of misfits and retreads in football. These Redskins were unwanted, but clung to their jobs. And in the opening weeks of the 1981 season, executed Gibbs' wide-open offense to perfection. Through the first five weeks of that season, we led the league in yards, completions, touchdowns. We're leading everybody. We have the best, we have best offense in football. Problem was, we're 0-5. The pressure now shifted to Washington's rookie head coach, winless in his first five games. Your successes in this league are marked in wins. We're going to have to uh, win to be successful. And I would be kidding uh, anybody if I said any differently. Tight end Rick Walker, number 88, had seen this all before. In four seasons with the Bengals and Redskins, he had seen four head coaches fired. Me, having seen four coaches kick to the curb, I thought, this is going to be 0 for 5. The thing that was so impressive about Joe Gibbs is that he never changed his approach. And you come in, you see Joe's car with the dew on it, and you go, hey, this guy hasn't left. If your coach is sleeping at the park, you don't want to be the guy that hangs out at a club all night and doesn't do what you're supposed to do. 44, high. What quarterbacks are supposed to do is win. Drowning in trade rumors, the 33-year-old Theismann was determined to convince his coach they shared a future beyond 1981. I didn't like the way things were between Joe and I. Drove to his house, and I can almost still see his face. Like, what are you doing here? And I said, Coach, we need to talk. Football is my life. I think somebody sold you a bill of goods. I think somebody's telling you that I don't love football. Yeah, I have restaurants. Yeah, I've done commercials. I, I do a lot. But I'll give up everything if you tell me to. And I'll just be your quarterback. Gibbs embraced Theismann and redesigned the offense around the players he had. We started to go to two tight end offense. We started to change and run the football a little bit more. We became more of a control the game style offense versus let's try and outscore the world offense. The Redskins were reborn. They won eight of their last 11 games in 1981. Will it be long enough? Yes. Will it go through? Yes. The football game is over. Washington had found a winning formula that would serve them well in 1982. a strong finish in 1981, not much was expected of the 1982 Washington Redskins. An 0-4 preseason only made things worse. After every preseason game, Joe Gibbs would come in and be screaming because we're not good enough. We would go into the preseason games with like three runs. We'd go in with like maybe four passes. Where's all the stuff we were running when we were winning? I, I actually thought he wanted us to lose every preseason game. Because when you win, complacency sets in. Complacency was not a problem for the Redskins and their roster of retreads. In the first game of the 1982 regular season, it was one of their misfits, kicker Mark Mosley, who fired the decisive shots. 26-yard attempt. Snap. Hold is good. Kick is up long enough. It's good. Mark Mosley's toe has sent it to overtime, and Mark Mosley's toe has won it in overtime. Mark Mosley, without question, was the most valuable part of our football team. Every time we needed a clutch kick, Mark would get it done. Thirteen socks, specially made shoe, 
Shu had to weigh 4,000 pounds. I don't know how he got it on. I swear his right leg is twice the size of his left. Just go out there and kick it the best you can, and don't worry about it. He had the blue collar style, you know, straight on kicker, big thighs, but you know he still had that kicker personality. He still had the fluffed up hair and you know the cologne. Yeah, he was a, I guess a metro, whatever you call a guy who actually cares about his appearance way before the term was ever introduced. He had mirrors, he had hairspray, creams, and he took a lot of abuse. You know, Mosley was tied up, gagged, thrown in the, in the mud. Uh, he was totally abused. And he was our MVP. To this day, I always say that he's a single reason that we're able to have flash the hardware because the guy kicked us out of a lot of jams. In Washington's second game, Mosley buried the Buccaneers with three field goals, but he could not kick the Redskins out of the gathering storm of a player strike. All NFL training facilities will be struck. We are prepared to withhold our services however long it takes. My initial reaction was, you know, why are we striking? I didn't play the game for the money. I played it because it was fun playing and I was good at it and the money was extra. I mean, that was a bonus. And I couldn't really understand why, you know, I mean, what else did you need? The players' union wanted more money. The owners wouldn't give it to them. And NFL stadiums fell silent. As the schedule toppled like dominoes, the rhetoric only intensified. They could take my car back, and they could take my, you know, my apartment. I really don't care. I'm sitting out for what I want. And right now, this agreement is not what I want. We've lost half the season now with the cancellation of next week's games. We're very close to losing the 1982 season. If the league cancels the season, the union is ready and able to schedule its own season of games. The players talked to cable TV's Ted Turner, who said if they wanted to play games outside the NFL, he'd televise them. With Ted Turner's backing, the players staged two all-star games, but the public showed little interest. It was weird. We played it one at RFK and one at the Coliseum. Two games in one week. Definitely was not an NFL crowd. I mean, I'll kid ourselves. There were more seats than people in the Los Angeles Coliseum. About 5,000 people sat in the stands to watch the AFC West defeat the NFC West. Ironically, it was while the Redskins were not playing games that Joe Theismann emerged as a team leader. Washington's quarterback rounded up his teammates and began running practices. We could not get anything from the coaches, so Joe would write up the seven-on-seven -seven script. He would call everybody. He would get everybody together. I mean, he was the guy that set up all that stuff and held that group together. We actually had full seven-on-seven -seven drills. Everybody talks about that coach on the field. Well, you know, we had our coach. You know, I, I really learned a lot about the role of leadership. Leadership isn't getting people to follow you. Leadership is getting people to believe in the same principle that you are and to have other people lead along with you. It keeps us together as a football team, and if, uh, if by some stroke of miracle something does break, we'll be ready to play football again. On November 16th, 1982, 57 days after it began, the longest work stoppage in NFL history finally came to an end. The strike is finally over. The players are back, the coaches are happy, and who knows about the fans? First hit of the game, first hit of the new season, kick some ass. Let's go! The Redskins had hung together. Now, they hung the Giants out to dry. Quick out on the far side to Charlie Brown. Beats his man, spins away from him. 15, 10, 5, going for the end zone. Touchdown! And off Riggins, sweeping left side. Then goes the diesel for a touchdown. Woo! Washington Redskins. If you weren't in shape, you will be. The strike had shortened the season to just nine games. 1982 would be a sprint, not a marathon. And the 3-0 Redskins were first off the blocks.
the rest of the 82 Redskins, the offensive line was a group nobody wanted. Three of Washington's linemen had to be cut by other teams. Number 66, Joe Jacoby, was an undrafted free agent. And number 68, Russ Grimm, was a high school quarterback still learning the intricacies of line play and the geography of the eastern United States. I got drafted by the Redskins in the third round and actually thought I was going to Seattle, Washington. I followed the Redskins, knew who they were, but for some reason it was just always stuck in my mind that it was the state of Washington. As a rookie in 1981, Grimm was relocated from center to left guard. He could handle the NFC East's finest and was the only Redskin who could block one of the most feared players in football, the Cowboys' nine-time Pro Bowl defensive tackle, Randy White. In his second season, Grimm was the inspiration for the legend that grew around Washington's offensive line. They needed some kind of a nickname. Just looking at Russ Grimm and Jeff Bostick, short little chubby fellows, and I said, come on, you hogs, let's get down here. And they, they kind of got a kick out of him. It kind of spread throughout the team. When he first said it, it, it's, I mean, it was just a statement. I mean, I didn't think anything about it. It was just a simple remark made during the course of a practice. It ended up that their little quote made it into the paper. No one would really think it's anything glamorous people want to be associated with hogs. But when things come out that blue collar guy can attach himself with, it goes off the chain. And this is exactly what happened with the hogs. I love them hogs. I love them hogs. I love them hogs. Yeah, I love them hogs. The marketing capabilities of George Stark, who was the right tackle, sort of thought, you know what? In this era of merchandising and marketing, why not make t-shirts? George Stark, you know, formulated Super Hogs Incorporated, three full-time employees, shirts, hats, a whole product line, and engagement. Why don't you turn around and suit, suit you on your back here? Okay. We do what other companies do, they're just companies that are independent outside of football. I just thought that it was inappropriate that the hog individuals be exploited by those who don't play. Company comes in, we want to pay you two, three thousand dollars back then to put a tux on and stand next to a big pig in a, in a farmyard, it was like, are you serious? The name got so big that restaurants would call us and say, we would love for you guys to come over for dinner on Thursday night at seven o'clock and we'll pick up the tab. The hogs were an exclusive group. Most Redskins failed to cut enough bacon. To become a member of the hogs was a special thing. Hey guys, can I get in? No, get out of here. They don't even do it in a nice way. They just tell you no. You can't be a hog. Hog or no hog, Washington had plenty of hams, and nicknames exploded across the Redskins roster. Every unit sort of developed their own personalities, and they decided they'd have to have their own monikers. The linebackers began calling themselves the Bald Eagles, and the secondary adopted an equally patriotic nickname. The bombardment has been so intense it seemed not even this could help. So the Redskins dubbed their deep backs the Pearl Harbor Crew. The Pearl Harbor Crew was actually people making fun of people bombing us. Instead of turning it as a negative, it turned it into a positive. And we had a lot of fun with it. You had Riga, the diesel. Uh, because he ran like a giant diesel truck going through everything. Drag up that diesel. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, oh, I'm. You know, I watched the Smurfs. They were little purple guys. Here we had these little wide receivers, and what better name for them? Hey, Smurf, Virgil. You know, it's amazing. Virgil's the smallest guy in the ball club. He's the only guy sitting down watching the game on the ground. Smurf one and Smurf two back into the game. It was just another element that went with this band of gypsies. Coach Gibbs must have sat in his office and go, what in the heck is going on with these people I have? But he let it breathe. Joe Gibbs allowed the Redskins to be themselves. Even a Sunday carpool could become a train wreck. Dave Butts, Mark Mosley, and I, we used to drive to games together. And this was a circus unto itself. Dave had this superstition. If he could run over certain types of roadkill going down the GW Parkway, it would determine how he was going to play 
all of a sudden, thump, thump, and Dave would go, yeah, groundhog, going to have a heck of a day. That's all you need to know about the Washington Redskins. We were a bunch of characters with character. In Washington's fourth game of the 82 season, all those characters overwhelmed the Eagles. The big hero was the Smurf with the Peanuts name, a good man named Charlie Brown. Seisman lets it go deep. He's got Charlie Brown down there, well covered. He makes the catch at the five and dives to the two. oddballs could play ball. At 4-0, the Redskins were the NFL's only perfect team. The 4-0 Redskins were now on America's radar. But if they were ever going to be number one, they would have to beat America's team. George Allen taught me to hate the Dallas Cowboys. He taught me to hate the star. He taught me to hate their shiny uniforms. The Roger Staubachs, the Danny Whites, the Tony Dorsets, the we're better than everybody attitude. The problem with all that was they were right. They were that good. And they came in in 82 and they kicked our tails. Joe Theismann was sacked seven times it was a humiliation for the Hogs. Our pass protection broke down. And give them the credit, they broke it down. They were just better. Blitz showing, Theismann straight drop, he's gonna get hit on the blitz and sacked. Kinda bust your bubble. The next week in St. Louis, the offense failed to score a touchdown. Only four Mark Mosley field goals saved the Redskins from an upset. Theismann set, snap, hold, kick is up, long enough. Is it good? Yeah. It is good. Mosley had made 18 straight. He would become the only kicker in NFL history to be named the league's MVP. But Washington's best player was its most outlandish. In 11 seasons as a pro, John Riggins had wandered through hairstyles and watering holes in a one-man carnival of the absurd. Being around John Riggins is like going to a soap opera or a circus every day. I believe that Coach Gibbs was scared to death to be alone in a room with John Riggins. Riggo was a, he went to a different beat. I don't think I've ever played with a tougher guy than John Riggins. I've seen him score umpteen touchdowns, never spike the football. I've seen him take some late shots, never get up and say anything to whoever hit him. If you didn't get your defender out of the way where he's coming, he'll run you over, he'll run the defender over. He's taking it to him, isn't he? You know, JR was an honorary hog, but JR could have been in the Over the Hill gang. He could have been with the Pearl Harbor crew. He could have done anything he wanted to be because he would have been accepted by all associations. Reagan served as president of Washington's most prestigious fraternity, the Five O'Clock Club. The Five O'Clock Club used to get together in a little shed that was located right off of one of our practice facilities. It was a shed that had, it couldn't be four feet square. And it's where they used to stick all the dummies. And the guys decided after practice it would be a great place to sort of hang out. Some guys hung out much, much longer than others. Some guys might have slept there on a couple of occasions. There was some Gatorade there and there was uh, Miller Lite, Budweiser, and and uh, believe me, there was no champagne in the 5 o'clock club. I'm sort of like the leader of the football team. You know, I, I now have become the quarterback. I, I, I wanted to be a part of it. He applied for membership to the 5 o'clock club, which was denied. He was not getting in the 5 o'clock club or the Hogs. Theismann had no trouble getting on television. Self-assured and silver-tongued, the Q rating overshadowed the quarterback. Some fans liked him, some fans didn't. That's Joe's personality. Yellow, 41, hide. To be a top NFL quarterback, you have to be a little cocky. You have to be able to sit back there with defensive linemen trying to take your head off and say, I can still fit this ball in between this linebacker and safety. First down pass, ends up, touchdown! 
I'll play with Joe Theismann anytime he wants to play. He's a great leader. He's, he's a tough guy. He's somebody that's going to fight to the end. That toughness was on full display in Washington's seventh game. The Redskins were playing for their first playoff berth in six years. I'm going to throw a quick hitch. I look out to my left side, and all of a sudden, Byron Hunt comes in from the right side unblocked. And for some reason, I turned and faced him. His helmet comes up under my single bar face mask and catches me right on the front teeth. And so I lose my two front teeth. Joe T, toughest individual I've ever seen in battle. As Hollywood as Joe was and could be, he was still a caveman when it came to Sundays. I'm looking at Joe Gibbs and he's looking at me going, holy mackerel. And I, I got no teeth and I'm trying to talk to him. It's okay. I'll be all right. I can communicate. Joe Washington starts to run a sweep out to the right side. All of a sudden, he turns and starts to come back my way. Now, I all of a sudden have a chance to become a lead blocker. And I remember coaches saying, throw your head across the front of him. Throw that right arm out. Now, all of a sudden, I'm possessed. I'm a pulling guard. He got a block from Bison. He's to the five. He's to the end zone. Touchdown. Before I know it, I'm being lifted up in the air. They're jumping up and down because Seisman threw the key block on Joe Washington's broken play touchdown run. I became a piglet. I did. I became a piglet. You know, I had I'd made it sort of into that fraternity of hogs. With just seconds to go, Theismann hooked up with Doc Walker, setting up Mark Mosley for an NFL record 21st consecutive field goal. A 42-yard attempt. Plenty long enough. It's good! Mark Mosley has broken the National Football League record. The Redskins were going to the playoffs, and their quarterback was all smiles. Joe, where are you going after you take a shower? I have to go to the dentist, uh, Jack. That one blitz that came from the right side knocked my two front teeth out. You want to zoom in on him here? Bring in the camera. Sure. <laughs> now, there goes his TV career. Uh, that's, that's this it. this oh, is dear. when we ought to have there that cannon my... shot of you. <laughs> For most of 1982, the Redskins relied on Mark Mosley. Five of Washington's first six wins were ultimately decided by their kicker. In the Redskins' final two games, they won in more convincing fashion. He's gone! Touchdown, Washington Redskins! Washington beat the Saints and Cardinals by a combined margin of 55-10. to 10. Far side, gets away from the man! Despite finishing the strike-shortened season with an NFL best 8-1 record, Washington's postseason prospects were not rosy. Four of their wins were by five points or less. Mark Mosley had finally missed a field goal. And their best receiver, Art Monk, was out for the playoffs with a stress fracture. You know, we weren't really an 8-1 football team in most people's minds. We were lucky. The real powerhouse in the, in the conference had beaten us, so how good could we really be? I think the part about the 82 team that was so unique, we were dependent upon one another. We realized that we weren't good enough to get cocky. The Redskins were beginning to question themselves. Before their first playoff game against the Detroit Lions, John Riggins strolled into team headquarters with the answer. John never said much. When John spoke, everybody listened because he said things so infrequently. He went in and talked to Coach Bugle and said, I want the ball. He says, I'm, you know, I'm ready to bust loose. And Coach Bugle told him to go see the man. It's been, I'd love to have heard the conversation, but I guarantee you Coach Gibbs had very little to say. I bet JR was doing all the talking. Joe Gibbs made the most pivotal decision of his coaching career. Against Detroit, he would put the Redskins' playoff fate in the hands of a 33-year-old running back who'd barely averaged three yards per carry during the regular season. John said we wanted to run the ball. You know, 
Let's run it. Load the wagon. Reagan's shifted into overdrive, running for 119 yards and willing Washington to victory. But inside the Beltway, the big story was a choreographed salute to Art Monk. We decided, hey man, you know, when you score, we're going to get together and we're going to have this jump. And really, we're jumping for Art. Filling in for the 6 2 Monk, 5 7 Smurf Alvin Garrett put on a larger than life performance. Alvin scores, and everybody's so excited. And Alvin forgot. He scores again. Back is Tyson. Quick lob into the corner of the end zone. Touchdown! Alvin Garrett with his second today. He forgot again. He scores his third touchdown. Near corner. He's got Garrett. He's got it. And this time he remembers. Oh, look at this. They're swinging their arms. Oh, a volleyball high five. And like the Hogs phenomenon, it just took off. The Fun Bunch became the newest addition to Washington's cast of outrageous characters. Programs! Redskins! Programs! Hoy! Hoy! In their second playoff game, the Minnesota Vikings issued a direct challenge to the Redskin offensive line. In Washington, everybody talked about the Hogs, this great offensive line, and the Vikings take it personal. So they start talking about, obviously, if you're going to, I guess, cut up a pig or a hog, you butcher them. That's the worst thing they could have done. 40 gut, first play. 50 gut, second play. 50 gut, third play. 40 gut, fourth play. 50 gut, fifth play. An inside hand up, Riggins, huge ball. Inside the 20, down to the 16 yard line. We had hand signals and Coach Bro going through these gyrations on the sideline. We were in the huddle saying, why are they wasting time with this? This one run the same play over and over and over. John just didn't run through holes against the Minnesota Vikings. He ran over people. He ran around people. It was that game that he exploded. Big run, John Riggins. I remember hearing that horn a lot. It was a diesel horn. Some fan brought into RFK. Yes, sir. Here it comes. Goes 395. How he powered this thing was a big mystery to all of us. But he had that horn going off. And I'm telling you what, it was a charge. I can get goose pimples today thinking about that, whatever I hear that noise. In all, Riggins carried the ball 37 times for 185 yards. Field dives forward. Did he get it? Touchdown, John Riggins. Crowd screaming and yelling and cheering. John ever the show takes his helmet off, bows to the crowd. This is for John Riggins, who does a bow at the 43 yard line. And then the place just goes electric with We Want Dallas. I mean, it, it brings the hair up. It still does. They said that they're going to come in here, you know, they're the butchers and we're the hogs. The thing they forgot is before a hog goes to the butcher, somebody got to kill it. Hog futures were on the rise. Only the Cowboys stood between the Redskins and Super Bowl 17. Everyone in the nation's capital was going hog wild over an NFC championship date with the Redskins' arch rival. It just seems to be the natural instinct of hogs that when they see a Dallas Cowboys jersey, they want to tear it apart. We didn't like Dallas, they didn't like us. We have to beat these guys. I don't want to sit here all offseason again hearing about Dallas. I'm certain that throughout time, people have had this exact same feeling when they had to go into great conquests. It's what most guys think the Super Bowl experience will be like, but the Super Bowl pales in comparison to this. Matched against the great Randy White, Russ Grimm played the game of his life, and the Redskins took control. We ran the ball like eight, nine times straight. Uh, not so much as a statement. We just felt that we could run the football. Reagan picked up about seven on that first carry, and he moved about 
six people with him. Behind Grimm's fairy tale performance, John Riggins ripped through the Cowboys for 140 yards. Washington was up 11 points, and Danny White was down for the count. White got shaken up by Dexter Manley, and White is down. Danny White looks like he's knocked out. First thought that went through my mind, thank God he's at it. They lose their starting quarterback. Got to be good for us. And Gary Hogeboom comes in. H-O-G-E, B double O M. And then Hogeboom steps in. And my God, it's not Gary Hogeboom. It's Roger Staubach in Gary Hogeboom's uniform. Hogeboom's a pass. He gets it away over the middle. Oh. From Johnson, touchdown. So it was the highest of highs, followed by being at a wake. Our place was silent. Then our defense. Our defense stepped up and made another play. Play action fakes the door set. Hit the ball well. Set up a screen, batted in the air, picked off by Darryl Brown. Touchdown, Washington Redskins! Wow. This was the moment. They were had it. There's a chance. They got a shot. Now they don't. The Redskins and their crew of characters were going to Super Bowl 17. The only formality was running out the clock. 4.26 left in the game. The Redskins will lead by 14. Take over at their own 38. Joe sends the play in. Spread right, 60 outside. Russ Grimm says, no. What do we mean no? So I want to run 50 gut. I want to run it Randy. When the play came in, it was something like... Why don't we run it outside? Let's let's just run the ball right at him again. They give it to Riggins over the left side before he's driven back. I look to the sidelines. Joe signals in 60 outside. All right, guys, we're going to run 60 outside. Russ goes, no. 50 gut. Riggins again. Sliding right beyond the 45. What do you think, Russ? He goes, 50 gut. Here's Riggins again from the left side, inside, outside, big yard, first down. Okay, guys, I think this is working. Spread right, 50 gut. Riggins is firing up the yard. Hey, why don't we try this play? 50 gut. He powers inside the 30, down there the 26. I look at Russ and he's going, Randy, it's coming at you. Riggins again, his eighth straight carry. This had nothing to do with running the clock out. This was between Russ Grimm and Randy White and the offensive line and Randy White. They wanted to bloody him. They wanted to beat him into the ground. They wanted to bury him. The game ends over, and the Redskins have won it 31 to 17. And they go to the Super Bowl. You watch so many Super Bowls. Wouldn't hear, I'd be home here having a little celebration, have people over. And now the same people will be watching me. And I love it! We're not real talented, we're not real great, but then we're the NFC champions, that's all that matters. The fact that we were going to a Super Bowl was basically anticlimactic. We had beat the team that everybody hated with a passion. All right, buddy, out the door. That moment is the one moment that stands out in my mind more than any in my entire career as a football player. An overwhelming sense of deja vu surrounded Super Bowl 17. It's going to be a capacity crowd very close to 103, 104,000. Eleven years after jilting the Dolphins for the Canadian Football League, Joe Theismann could erase his biggest blunder. He could have played in three Super Bowls for Don Shula. Now he was playing against Shula in his first. The rest of the Redskins were playing for what was then a staggering amount of money. It was kind of like, well, how much do we get if, you know, we win the Super Bowl? And I think somebody said it was like $70,000. And I think I was making 60 that year. So I only got 30 because of the strike. We worked hard this game's about the money, here. but it's Everybody about the ring. Team, and it's worth 70000 <laughs> And a big ring. A big blanking ring.
Don Shula's Dolphins were also playing for that ring, and they dominated the first half. 76-yard touchdown pass. David Woodley caught the defense with a pants down. After struggling for the first 26 minutes, Theismann put together an 11-play scoring march before halftime. Theismann loads it up. Out of the backfield of Walker. Far side, 30. Wide open. <laughs> Lob into the end zone. Garrett there. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. We are back. Here comes the fun bunch in the end zone. Let's kick off to him. Let's kick off to Fulton Walker. He's got it at the two, on to the five, to the ten. Comes Let's the stand on the, the sidelines and watch Fulton Walker run almost 100 yards. He's gone. It's a touchdown. And as soon as the Redskins tie up, the Dolphins come back on top. We were right for the kill because of the, the Dallas win. This team was spent, emotionally, physically spent. We needed to be forced back into being desperate. In the second half, Washington's defense began suffocating David Woodley. He has no completions in the second half. That's right. Even Joe Theismann's biggest play was as a defensive back. We're backed up on our own end, and then Kim Bocamper knocks it up in the air. My whole world goes into slow motion. I feel like I've got these giant cement slippers on. And I look at the ball go up into the air. I looked at the intersection of where I thought the ball would land, and if I could get my hand up underneath it, I might be able to strip it. Oh, Lord! Oh, was that almost the game breaker? And number 58, Kim Bocamper, came very, very close to an interception for a touchdown. Theismann's stop set the stage for this team's defining moment. Trailing 17-13 with 10 minutes to go. Washington bogged down on Miami's 43. The Redskins' entire season had come down to fourth and a yard. There was no doubt in my mind we had to go for it. This is who we were. We were the Washington Redskins. We were the Hogs. We were John Riggins. Had to be 70 chip. The Redskins bet the farm on the Hogs. Let's go. Goal line, goal line. I left tight wing, 70 chip on white. Ready? Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. The yellow 41! Yellow 41! There's the snap hand over. Good hole. He's got the first down to 40. He's gone. The 35, the 30, the 40. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Look at his face. Just look at the man's face. It tells you the entire story. My second year in a league, and we just won a Super Bowl. Woo! Watch the Redskins, number one in the world! Super Bowl champs! Woo! In my mind, what was emblazoned there was Terry Bradshaw, Namath, running off the field, waving his finger. And at that moment, ball went up, finger went up, and we were champions of the world. For the first time I in God. 1942, the Washington Redskins have an NFL championship. It's the first Super Bowl that I was a part of. And those guys that were on that football team, out of 53, I bet you I'll probably, if somebody tested me, I could name 51 or 52 of them. And I'd be upset for the guy that I forgot. Nothing beats the fellas. Nothing beats the moments with the guys. If I had to give the ring up, but I could keep my experience with the guys, I keep my experience with the fellas. We were a group of has-beens, would-have-beens, could-have-beens, nobody wants. And that became our battle cry. That became the common thread that bound us all. We were a group of 
group of guys who nobody had great expectations of except ourselves.